Well, welcome to the Between Two Sheets podcast. Today we have a very special podcast for you. Uh, we are with Marika and Mark. They're the owners of Outremer's new flagship 55 model. They've had a, quite a journey and uh, they've had quite an accident recently. Uh, we're going to get into that on the podcast. We're going to get into their thoughts on the boat. We're going to get into who they are, how they got into sailing, and, and how they ended up with this magnificent boat. If you're listening to the recorded version of this podcast, I urge you to go to Sailing Zingaro YouTube channel and watch this one, just because we're going to have a lot of B-roll of the boat and we're going to get a tour and we're going to see all of the um, broken parts from the accident. And we're going to hear what Ochimer is, is doing for you guys and how you're going to fix this, because this is a pretty intense problem. It's one of those problems where uh, logistically, some things are not possible to repair. So I heard that Ochimer was up all night last night uh, with their engineering team trying to figure out how to get these guys back on the road because they're part of the Ochimer rally. So without further ado, this is Marek, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for introducing me. Yeah, no problem. So firstly, I'd just like to get a little bit about your story and where you're from, how you got into sailing, how you convinced your husband to um, get you, you know, Ochimer 55. For my birthday. <laughs> For your birthday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I started sailing when I was really young. I think I was about six, year old, six years old when uh, my father bought a, uh, a boat. It was actually a Swallow, Swallow 2. So I was sailing since I was young and uh, it was always my dream to go around the world when I grew up and uh, ever since you were a little kid you had that ever dream. since a little kid I had a dream to go around the world D once did you do you remember what sparked that dream I like, don't know was I it just, a book I just loved sailing I, I read a lot about, of books about sailing every time when I found a, a blog of somebody or a book I read everything I loved it the adventures going around the world and seeing uh, all different cultures and uh, yeah it was just a dream. And then when I met Mark 25 years ago, um, he told me, I wanted to learn sailing. I, uh, I'm not against it because he couldn't sail at that moment. But to be honest, I am never ever going to be with you around the world because I want to see land always. So actually we bought a house together on a lake in Holland. And we started sailing with smaller boats. Uh, on that lake and with a nacra, with a, cat a small catamaran. And, um, and we rented boats all over the world together. So that was the first thing that we were doing. And then actually five or six years ago, we said we would like to have a little bit bigger boat for on the lake with a, with a cabin in it. Um, and then I went on the internet looking for a boat and actually I found exactly the boat that we sold, that I sold 22 years ago, that I had when I was in my 20s. The same boat? Exactly the same boat, was for sale at that moment. And we actually, um, my ex-husband and me, we sold it to an older couple in, I think it was 1992. And, uh, and 22 years later, they had it for sale and they really yeah, they took so good care of the boat. It was actually more beautiful than when we sold it 22 years later. What are the chances? And then Mark and me, we said, we just buy it back. And it's a beautiful Rifle 34. So we started sailing in Holland a little bit together um, on the IJsselmeer and to the islands in the north of Holland and a little bit at sea. And then Mark, he was really enjoying it. He was just enjoying it. And then he said, OK, I think I can lead a life like this. But then I want a little bit bigger boat. So we bought a Lagoon 39 and brought it to Holland. And, um, and then we started sailing. So the first trip that we did was to the north of Norway, to the Lofoten above the Arctic Circle. Oh, that must have been sweet. And for him, that was nice because it was along the coast of Norway. But it was also lots of not seeing land. So he slowly got used to that. So from after sailing for uh, a year in, uh, in the Lagoon 39, uh, Mark said, no, we're going to sell it and we're going to buy a Lagoon 52. So for me, that was a big step and I was very afraid of it. 
And uh, but we were extremely happy with that boat. It was a beautiful boat. It sailed well. Uh, we had a huge storm with it, and um, actually, it performed very good. Yeah, and then after I think three and a half years in the lagoon, we made the next step to this Ultramare 55. And slowly, um, we were sailing more and more. We were not seeing land. Mark got used to it. And even, I think, three years ago, he said, OK, we are now sailing in Europe. I'm fine with that. We did the whole Mediterranean, we did Norway, and uh, he was fine with that. But he said, I'm never going to cross an ocean. <laughs> the guy is not very reliable, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell him that. No, 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 we don't tell him. But a year later, he said, I think I'm ready. We're crossing the ocean. Because I was really happy sailing. Wow, he was the one. He was the one, yeah, because I didn't push him. Because wow. uh, I was like, if you don't want, I'm totally happy sailing in Europe. I had everything I wanted. I had a beautiful lagoon sailing in the Mediterranean, so I had no complaints. But then a year later, he, he uh, said, yeah, let's cross the ocean. I was like, OK, we will do that. So we did cross the ocean. We went to the Ark with the Lagoon 52 and we were planning to um, to go to the west coast of uh, America for the hurricane season but then uh, COVID came, lockdown came and we couldn't go anywhere anymore. We were locked down in uh, the BVI and decided uh, after um, one and a half months in the BVI we decided to sail back to Holland and because we already bought the new Outremer we had the Lagoon 52 for sale and we sold it in Holland and then we were one year without a boat and we sailed, the, uh, sorry, we filmed the whole process uh, of the building of this boat. Oh, really? Yes, you got it's to go all to... on YouTube and the, all the choices that we make, are we going to make, uh, are we going to do a rotating mast, yes or no? What are the advantages, disadvantages for us? It's not, it's not like science. It's, okay, we're going to get into that. Really. Yeah, it's only our choices that we've made. Okay. So it's not that we, that we are saying that we are the truth. Everybody makes different choices. So, but we filmed everything and why we made our choices. And we did that the whole year. And that helped us through the lockdowns. Uh, yeah, so we were a lot in the Gaan de Mot. Wait, then, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm misunderstanding. You yeah. were locked down in the BVI's with your yes. lagoon and then you flew back to no, France? No, we sailed the, the boat back to Holland. Oh, you sailed back yeah. during during lockdown, yes. during um, yeah. the the beginning yeah. of the pandemic, and then uh, sailed to France and and no, no, we we sailed to Holland. Okay. And our Dutch lagoon dealer uh, uh, was there, so we put, we put the boat there close to the Dutch lagoon uh, dealer in Stavoren, and there we sold the boat, and that was pretty easy because we have this YouTube channel. Yeah. So it was actually one of our followers who's now really happy with that really? boat. Really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And so, then you were able to go and, and film the most of the production of the Ochimer. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. The whole production, we filmed everything. We filmed all our choices, yeah. sail configuration, electronics, electrics, everything. Color. Colors, interior. Is, is the orange standard? Yeah, no. That, 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 no I, everything here is, uh, is a little bit different from the standard because we got a chance okay. to go to Nantes, to the interior designer of uh, Outremer, because most Outremers are designed with a little bit fast image in it. And we prefer to have a homely image. So uh, a little bit old-fashioned, a little bit more wood, uh, a little bit darker colors. So um, this is what we put together, together with Frank Garnett, that's the um, interior designer. And he's really good because he designed something different for Outremer. And when we were there, um, he totally understand what we were uh, thinking and what we wanted to have. And together with uh, him, we designed it this way. So did he have some kind of like CAD drawing that you could you could see it yes. in different colors? And yes, but it was difficult because he has to, uh, it takes a long time to uh, um, render. render the material. Thank you, darling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were making the choices and he showed a little bit, but then later on we got the renderings of what we were choosing cool. and then we were like, And then you were like, yes, yeah, that's it. That's, that's exactly it. what we wanted. That's what we wanted. Oh, cool. So, yeah. And that's, of course, very nice with a brand like Outremer that you can make these choices. Mm -hmm. It's not that, OK, the standard, I, I really want something different than the standard. And then at least there is a possibility to do that.
Okay. So, yeah. So back to the story. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to all these points. I have yep. tons of questions already. Oh my God. But uh, <laughs> I, want, I want to finish, like get us to where you're at now. So you're, you're in lockdown, you're waiting for the yep. ocean mirror, you're filming the whole thing, it gets delivered. You guys, what did you feel when you, when you actually got to step on the boat for the first time? Oh my God, I think when we saw the ocean mirror getting finished and we saw it hanging in the crane and it is absolutely the most beautiful catamaran I've ever seen. And I think people always do that, their own baby is always the no, most no, beautiful. No, it's the most beautiful one I've ever seen too. It's so, really but nice. It is a really cool boat. It is very beautiful. And also, uh, in combination with the insight that uh, what we uh, did together with Frank Darnet, I'm so happy with this boat. It is very beautiful. Yeah. So, and actually we have all the luxury that we used to have on the lagoon. We have it on this boat too. So we have no complaints whatsoever. Good. Yeah, yeah. So, and then uh, in July, uh, it was delivered to us. That's the 2021? Uh, 21, yeah. Okay. So actually- Not very long ago. Half a year ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and during the process that we were building the boat, Utrecht told us about the rally that they were organizing at the Grand Large Group. They are organizing a rally. It's a little bit like the Ark, but then for going around the world completely. It was Grand Large together with Jimmy Cornell who organized this rally. And uh, is he part of the rally? Is he, yeah, is he no, a... he's not part. He's not attending the rally, Got but it. he organized it together with uh, Grand Large Group. Yeah. Cool. And then we said, this is actually our chance of going around the world. Because we are both not very technical. We are sailors in the meantime, and uh, we are not racers, we are sailors, cruisers, and, uh, but we are not technical at all. Yeah. Of course, we learned a lot having so many boats because a lot of problems always, so you learn every day. But uh, we can't say that we are uh, having fun, repairing stuff, etc. And in this rally, it's perfectly organized. Utrecht flies in to do all the maintenance on the boat, to repair everything. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, we are very happy with it. Cool. So for us, this was a chance for a world, world trip. And yeah, and this, yeah. this would be, um, you know, a lot of people that choose to go on rallies choose to go on them because there's strength in numbers, there's a big team of people, the, the, the people that organize the rally organize everything. So you get um, marinas, yeah. check-ins, yeah. all of that is like, okay, look, we've already taken care of all of it. Yeah, exactly it's going to be, you know, very, very smooth for everyone. And yeah. man, I tell you, with all of the problems that I've had with logistics, yeah. it is so nice. I yeah. mean, I, I used to say that I'll never go on a rally because I, I want to be independent and I want to be on my schedule. but. I can absolutely see the draw. Um, yeah, but this, I can understand exactly uh, your arguments for not going on a rally, but actually this rally is only 30 boats. It's, uh, we can choose our time. Actually, the, the Atlantic crossing, nobody started on the date that was scheduled for it. Oh, really? So it is just, you have so much freedom within the schedule that we are having. And another thing that you didn't mention that I think is a real advantage is the social advantage. Yeah, of course. We are like a small village, like 30 boats. Everybody knows each other. And then you meet that one and then you meet the other one. And everybody has a lot of freedom. Like from now we are sailing from Martinique to Panama, but there are guys going through. Uh, we went from to Venezuela and the ABC islands and then Colombia, but there are also guys going north. Uh, and then going to Panama, there are people going straight and having to work in the meantime, put the boat in Panama for a while. So everybody's free to do whatever they want. Interesting. And then there is this period in the beginning of March where everybody, except for us and Spec Ain't, I will tell that story later, um, going through the canal. Yeah. Well, I would suggest um, before you get through the canal, I know you guys are going to be behind and you guys, you guys are going to want to yeah. make up time. Yeah. See the San Blas Islands. Yeah. Spend at least a week there. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. Beautiful. A lot of cruisers say that's their favorite spot. A lot of circumnavigators, I'm sorry, say that that was their favorite place really? in the world. Really? You kind so of have to it. go. You there. have to yeah. see it. Spend a even, week even and then, and then skip all the rest. Yeah, because we have already seen the Galapagos in one of our holidays uh, in 2013, it was. So the Galapagos, we know we had a beautiful holiday there. Uh, so we don't mind skipping the Galapagos, but we want to be with the group again uh, before we are crossing the Pacific. Perfect. So, and then do the Marquesas together. So yeah, we okay. hope to catch up there. 
but a miracle would happen if that if we can reach that goal yeah yeah well we'll see yeah. i think the miracle is going to happen for you guys it looks like it so yeah so look you guys we're on the boat right now and if um if you hear things moving, uh, it's it's blowing quite a blow today. It's probably gusting to 30, 35 knots. And uh, you can hear the traveler from the jib, from the self-tacking jib kind of moving around and some lines uh, vibrating. So uh, so if you hear those sounds, that's, that's what that is. Okay, so that gets you up to this point. Um, now you guys had very recently um, a, a fairly large accident with the boat. Can you? Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, Mark, can you come over and help me with that? Because maybe I'm- It's time to introduce the man of the Yeah, household. yeah, yeah, because I'm getting a little bit emotional if I'm talking Aww. about that. What, what are we talking about? About the crash. About the crash. Yeah. yeah. So what happened with that? Uh, well, well, first we we left uh, Bonaire in, in, um, in strange circumstances as our best friends uh, on the rally. Uh, uh, had to fly home all of a sudden for medical reasons. Uh, she found out on, on Bonaire that uh, that they had to go uh, home as fast as possible. So they had to leave the boat there, uh, probably selling uh, spec uh, Oh no! Uh, now, so this this oh, is so awkward. Uh, we plan to be with them uh, about three years, and uh, then all of a sudden, uh, well, we had to continue, and they uh, and they were gone. Um, so in that condition, we were leaving Bonaire and, and hoping to be able to uh, get a rest uh, uh, along the route to, uh, to Panama. And, and the first try we did was uh, in, uh, in Curaçao. And so uh, we were called uh, by the, the Coast Guard and uh, asked for our attentions. Well, we, we explained that we were... Uh, we only wanted to, to, uh, to be on an anchor rest. for the night and have a rest and then continue in the morning. But, uh, well, several tries and, and didn't matter that we didn't want to come ashore or whatever. Uh, it was only possible if we uh, cleared in all the way and uh, got a PCR test and everything. And that would have slowed us down way too much. So yeah, we, and, uh, and make us even more tired because yeah, that was the reason why we want to stop, just to sleep. In the end, the guy said to us after several attempts, he said, no, you're not allowed. And then he, he ended the conversation with, uh, yeah, stay safe. And then we were like laughing because we said, we asked this permission to stay safe. They say no. We arrived yeah. here uh, in the middle of the night, uh, 4 a.m. Uh, so we just dropped anchor in, in a spot that we knew we would be, or we, at least we thought we would be safe. Uh, uh, in front of uh, Eagle Beach, there, uh, there, it's it's pretty shallow, but there are no obstacles whatsoever. So we very carefully uh, ended up there and dropped the anchor and uh, got a rest. Uh, the other boat that was still with us, uh, Nutromea 51, uh, in Kiblu, they were just uh, a couple of hours behind us, and they arrived there as well. Uh, I think just before uh, sunrise. And then, uh, of course, we had to wait until they were awake again as well. And then we did uh, another route, weather routing, uh, which um, uh, led us to a plan to leave then the next morning at 6 a.m. Or went, 4 a.m. even, because yeah. we wanted to be in, in San Blas in the light. In the, yeah. So uh, somewhere in the middle of the night. You can't arrive in San Blas in the middle of the night. No, that's a very dangerous archipelago. Yeah, yeah so, so we, so so we planned we to just, leave. We just had to do it like this uh, out of safety uh, uh, even if we wouldn't have been that tired then uh, then even then we would have uh, had to do it like this um, but apparently it's not an option as the rules are different you have to check in here you have to do a PCR test as yeah, well that's correct yeah whether you go on land or not uh, so let me get this right just to make sure I understand you guys pulled in Anchored at Eagle Beach for, for one night. Your friends pulled in a, a few hours after you. Yeah. And then the next day you did some weather routing and you stayed there for, for another day. And then... And then in the next night, so we arrived in one night and the next night we wanted to leave. So we slept most of the day and uh, and uh, went to bed very early. I, went, I went, was in bed at eight, I think. Yeah. 
So I was really deep asleep when it happened. Oh, what what time did the boat? Uh, well, uh, I was I was still editing here a little bit, and uh, but Marijke urged me to come to bed early as well, so I would be fit the next day. And uh, I would do the same if, yeah, I, but, if I were on the boat. I would urge you to come to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah, but but I wish I wouldn't have because uh, I went to bed just just uh, after nine and at nine thirty we were hit. Oh no! Yeah, so so if I would have stayed up, if I would have watched one additional episode on Netflix or whatever, then all the lights would have been well. Yeah, but then it's, still, it's not even sure because the, then still he would have might might uh, have hit us. It's it's well. They've been really friendly to us afterwards, so I, I don't want to uh, say bad things about them. But um, let's let's put it this way: the boat that hit us has a very large uh, uh, bow with a, bow, a huge bowsprit, and it's really difficult to see uh, to look forward on it. Yeah, it's about a hundred and hundred foot ship wood yeah. with a very pronounced uh, bow and then yeah. and then a bowsprit in the front so yeah exactly i'm sure that that captain has made this trip three times per day for the last 10 years and there's not ever anybody there never so he just it was just bad timing yeah. and a bad bad anchorage very, very spot. bad luck yep and we we haven't seen it uh happening of course so we 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 can't be too precise but just looking at the damage, it's, it's pretty clear what uh, happened. He it must have hit uh, our bridle and the anchor chain first. Yeah. Because if that ship would have hit us directly, then uh, it would have sank. Uh, it would have I don't want to. I, sure. I don't even want to think about that. So because, uh, yeah, it looks like what happened was they hit your they hit your uh, bridle and then the boat just got sucked into the boat and it and it snapped the front. Yeah. Off. Yeah, and you're really lucky that it didn't even touch the bows at all. Yeah, I mean, a little bit on the on you one got bow, a but a little scrape. Yeah. I mean, that's ten minutes yeah, of work. Well, yeah. let's well, say ten hours, but yeah. But then also we are extremely lucky because this boat is so strong. The connection with the so the crossbeam is completely damaged. It's total loss. But the connection of the crossbeam and the bow, you don't even see a scratch. Nothing, or, nothing. Or any gel coat cracks or anything. Nothing. Because that took a, a very big yeah, amount well, of stress. There, there's, if, you, if you look closely, you can even see there's a bend in the crossbeam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going, uh, it's, going it's, like it's this. It's a little now. bit like that's a banana. Because, that's because your rigging is still tight. Yeah, and, and the and the A-frame broke, of course. Yeah. So that's the reason yeah, why. But the, even, even then, uh, there's no crack whatsoever in the attachments to the hull. So that must be really, really, really strong. Yeah. yeah, but when you come out of bed, and I was in a really deep sleep already, when you come out of bed and the first thing you see is that the sheet is not tightened anymore, it's oh loose. Boy. So you see the boom. Getting... So I was like, Mark, watch out because the mast might not be stable. Yeah. So uh, so we immediately uh, supported the mast with two halyards on the, uh, on on the, the bows, on the front cleats. And um, yeah, so and then you're starting to realize what happened to you. So, oh, I'm yeah. so sorry, guys. Yeah. That sucks. So basically, this is the problem. They broke a piece of the boat that is seven meters by five meters. Yeah, it yeah, is it's the, like a cross. The entire length from the bridge deck all the way forward to the bowsprit and the cross member is all, and the A-frame is all one piece, and it's made in a huge factory in France. So if the boat's there, they can make another one, but the but it's going to take them six months to make it. And then how do they ship it down here? It doesn't fit in the plane, doesn't fit in a container, it doesn't fit on a ship. Uh, it'll get damaged if they just put it on top of something. First of all, how was the dealing with Ochermare when you said like, hey guys, guess what? We wrecked your boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, they wrecked our boat. <laughs> uh, but. Um, yeah, well, we, we obviously uh, got to know them uh, pretty well when, when we were there. Uh, we've been staying in Lagana Mot for uh, half a year to a year when the boat was built. Um, so we are able to get in touch uh, really quickly. And um, uh, yeah, of, of course, they were uh, shocked by the news as well. And uh, they had to give it some thoughts uh, on, on how to progress. Uh, but then they uh, sat together with uh, with a team uh, because they needed. Uh, I, I gave them the inputs and the photos uh, and uh, all the damaged parts, and it was uh, pretty soon clear to them that that uh, the crossbeam uh, is gone, 
uh, the cross has to be uh, replaced and we should we can't move the boat anymore uh, so that limits the options uh, as well so they um, they sat together with their design office uh, that you have to know the design office of uh, Utermeer as Utermeer is part of the Grand Large uh, Yachting Group and um, they work for gunboat as well uh, the, uh, the gunboat is right next to the Utermeer factory and um, so they, they got some knowledge uh, right there and then uh, to um, to decide what else to do because our boat was all, of course prepared for this carbon cross and uh, the normal setup with uh, with the polyester uh, aluminium yeah it's it's the it's the aluminium cross cross beam with a with a polyester longitudinal beam oh, okay. okay if i understand it correctly and um, and then because we have the sails for this bowsprit, like the A2 and uh, the downwind Jenniker, and uh, uh, they may fit on a normal setup as well, but the attachments uh, are different. Yeah. So they oh, they needed. No. Yeah. So, so they, 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 they couldn't uh, just send the stand the standard part that's on a standard 55. Wow. Like on uh, uh, on Zappoli, yeah. Yeah, the, because the, the standard bowsprit, uh, the standard crossbeam and bowsprit is two separate parts. So it's like you can ship it like this. It can go in a plane. So it's not like a T. It's two parts. But that's not even an option. They're going to have to. But make they have to custom. modify that one because yeah. it doesn't fit standard on our boat. So, so I'm I'm not sure. I think they 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 use the the carbon mold to make a polyester variant of it. I, I, we're going to see when the, when the stuff arrives oh, that here would be because cool. they did something really cool. The guys of the design office worked through the night. Uh, so they uh, they planned a meeting the next day at 12. Well, well, of course, that's two days after the crash. They had a meeting uh, to make a decision which of the three alternatives uh, they're going to take. Another alternative was just to put the crossbeam in and then make one giant uh, trampoline. The, the boat is so stiff and and, uh, and strong that they don't actually need this longitudinal, longitudinal yeah. beam for the for the strength of the boat, which surprised me a lot. But but apparently uh, you can also do it with just the crossbeam for the structural strength. Wow. Uh, I'm sure they were talking about what do we do? Do we do a, a curved bow beam? Do we do uh, yeah, send them the other gear and just just with different mounts for it? They had three alternatives, but this the 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 option they're uh, being able to produce now was their favorite option, and uh, so they they do think that they are able to do it in time. Um, uh, and in time, what do they mean by in time? Yeah, in time that we uh, can catch up with the rest. We can, catch up with the, uh, with the rest of the fleet. And it must be important for them to have their flagship model on the Ochmer Rally. There there are two other 55s on the rally, so I, I I think they're fine without, well, they're fine without us, but... But you're the one who's filming it. Yeah, but so, yeah, but yeah. still, uh, they're, yeah. they're a professional uh, cameraman uh, every once in a while as well. Um, I, I think it, it's it's irrelevant that we have the YouTube channel. Uh, they have a very good reputation of, of looking after their customers in general. So, but well, what they're doing now, uh, it, it's uh, it's surprised. Yeah, it's well, amazing. surprised is not a good word, but but we were so impressed by yeah, uh, yeah. by I this was level completely of completely emotional. I could when when they were oh you must because, have, you must have been crying when this oh, happened yeah. huh? and and to be honest after, in the weekend after it happened and uh, before we spoke to yeah we already spoke to Otto but before they had their meetings and trying to yeah, find true it happened on Friday Friday yeah, evening it's Friday on Friday evening and we had contact with Otto already but of course they had their meetings about solutions on Monday only so during this weekend we already sort of accepted the fact that we were not going to continue the rally, that it was over for us oh. and that we might even need to sold, sell the boat or whatever. So we accepted sort of every possible outcome. And then when we had them on the phone uh, on Monday and they were telling us what they were doing and what they were trying, and we were like, oh my God, this is not true. This is not true. And then on Wednesday, finally, they told us, I think we can make it work. And they work day and night wow. to find a solution. What day is today? And we were like, this it's is now Friday. No, this is Thursday. Thursday. I'm sorry. Thursday. So yesterday, yeah. yesterday they called us and I was like, oh my God, this is not happening. This is not happening. 
As in joyful, so, joyful. Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay, but then, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we got a phone call from Stefan Grimaud. He's the managing director of Outermeer. Yeah. And uh, uh, he said, well, I hope you have a bottle in the fridge. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I think uh, we're going to perform the miracle you asked for. And, Sweet. Uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's but still, there are so many uh, obstacles to take, like, for instance, the transportation, uh, the, the customs here. Uh, and uh, uh, the the crane that is currently not in use here in Aruba. So, but also here in Aru in Aruba, the people of the of the of the, of the yard Far Faradero. Faradero were, were so nice, because at the moment they are planning to have the crane ready at the seventh of March, and they couldn't uh, they didn't have any place before the ninth or the tenth of March. And then we got an email, we just got an email from them. We are going to reshuffle and you will be helped on the 7th of March. As soon wow, as the, the first boat. Yeah. So they are really nice and helpful. And but still, you never know yeah. if there's a technical problem and the crane can't be ready. So yeah, the cart yeah. on which the boat has to be uh, dragged out of the water. It's in it's so to be on top. It, it's it's oh, it's in it's, so many pieces at the moment. Many oh, parts, no. and it, it's upside down. And, <laughs> oh, and no. we went there yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And, and Rishi is the technical guy from Valladero, uh, and his men are, are working on it uh, really hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we can only hope that they manage to uh, to repair it in time. Uh, uh, because otherwise we have to be really, really, really creative. Yeah. It 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 doesn't, especially in these winds. It's, it's blowing here all the time, or yeah. It's never yeah. without winds. So. Aruba's Aruba's in a really interesting place because of the pan uh, of of land between Venezuela and Aruba. Uh, you like if you get out to Curacao and Bonaire, you you get several hundred feet of between the mainland of Venezuela and uh, the islands. So there's enough depth to keep the, the winds and the uh, current down. But right here, we're the closest of the three islands to Venezuela. Yeah. And, and there's not a lot of depth in between. It's only about 300 feet of, of water in between, and it's kind of flat. So for some reason, Aruba gets the strongest trade winds in almost any of the Caribbean. And it's always blowing 20. Today, it's blowing, what, 31 you just yeah. saw? Yeah. And it's a very unique place. Plus, they're not really logistically able to handle a lot of huge repairs for cruising. I mean, this isn't a place that a lot of people stop just because it, it's not got a very good anchorage. You move around a lot. It's not as comfortable as, say, uh, Curacao, where you're up inside a real nice bay. And for the, the logistics for you guys and the repercussions of being hit here in Aruba, it's a very difficult problem. Yeah. Okay, so what is the decision for the option to repair the, the boat? Yeah, so they're, they're going to do their favorite option uh, where the, uh, the cross beam and the longitudinal beam will be there. And then in two separate parts. So uh, they think they can transport it by plane, which is a huge difference, of course, as well. And then they're, they're going to make some custom-made parts to uh, enable uh, those two to connect and to be able to use all our uh, sales as well. Wow, and the, what conne an and the connection to our beam, connection to, to, the, uh, to the hills. To, to the hills. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly, again, I don't know exactly what they did, but. I can't wait to see. Yeah. I don't really care as long as they they produce something that, that is going to take us out of here. And, and yeah, but then we have the other thing that we have to solve. The Of course, it's a temporary uh, solution because the boat has to go back to the normal state. So we might uh, sail it or to uh, Australia and New Zealand if they can ship uh, a carbon cross. The carbon cross there. Or we even sail completely around the world with it. But at least at some time the boat has to be go has to go back to the old state yes uh, before before it sells it yeah, needs, it needs sell to it. be back yeah. into its so it is a sort of a temporary solution so the insurance company also has to agree to that and ha they have to pay twice basically yeah. oh, no, not twice because the, but, the, but the, the discussion is that if we have to be here for a year then the additional cost of uh, lodging and, and uh, keeping the boat in the marina, et cetera, et cetera, and additional damages that might occur there. 
are uh, and the fact that we have to stop this rally already paid for it etc so yeah, it's, not are, a, it's not a cheap rally. it might not even it might not even be it might be more different. expensive yeah it might even be more expensive to leave the boat here and yeah. uh, and stop so because the temporary solution is a is a cheaper solution than uh, than the carbon but if you think about it from an here. engineering standpoint i wouldn't even call it a temporary solution because it can't be a temporary solution they're thinking we, this needs to be just as strong yeah, because yeah, these guys are yeah, going to be going yeah, around no, the world. No, yeah. it's, going to, it's going to be as strong as the other, uh, as, as the current option. Mm -hmm. But then this one, of course, is, is much lighter with the same strength. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be a bit uh, heavier than, uh, than we were. But this is an option, correct? Yes. So the base model of this boat would come with a polyester. Yeah, yeah. exactly. T. Yeah. But because we already sold the boat, it's sold with a carbon cross. Now it needs a carbon cross. Or so. they need to cover your the difference, right? Yeah, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, oh. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into that. We've <laughs> talked about the wreck. Let's not go over it anymore. No. It's, it's, it sucks. You're going um, to you're gonna film everything, right? So we can follow this on your YouTube channel. And yes. See, see how it's put yeah, in. Yeah, and... we're pretty much up to date. So uh, the, the episode we, well... Uh, by the time by the time you publish your podcast and uh, it's probably uh, it's all already done hopefully yeah i'm hoping i'll keep my fingers crossed for you yeah um but if you guys would like to see that what is your what is your youtube channel it's called uh, great circle cat great cat, circle cat, cat. for catamar uh, for catamaran great circle cat great circle Okay, so youtube.com slash cat great circle or just just look up great circle catamaran. Yeah, both or both. or if you just look up Ochermare fifty five, you guys are probably the only yeah. ones on, with a YouTube well, channel yeah. with this boat, right? Yeah. So uh, there's yeah. a lot of different ways to follow the story. Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, and normally it's a happy story. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> About. It'll be a happy story. I I, uh, I think that team really wants you guys to keep going. Yeah, and they probably really like you guys. I mean, you spent a year there and documented uh, this is just, the build. And this has just been a shitty week for uh, for the whole group. Yeah, as the the thing with Pekin that happened. Yeah, I'm sorry else. about that. And then and, and there was and another boat, and there was a woman uh, going overboard. Oh no! With a broken leg or oh. a hip, I don't know exactly. She went overboard. It's a miracle that they found her. Wow. Uh, because with these fast boats during the day. Uh, it's seven o'clock in the morning. Oh. Uh, there was something. There was something wrong with the spinnaker, so she went forward, and we don't know the story exactly. But uh, she was sort of uh, capit uh, catapulted. Yeah, catapulted. Yeah, she was sort of capital. She was sort of cap catapulted. Ca catapulted. <laughs> catapulted. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. Overboard, and she broke something, so she was in uh, the sea with a broken leg or That's head. the worst nightmare so, of any captain. And, and then heading to Los Rocos, where you there's absolutely nothing there. But uh, yeah, also with this rally, everybody was finding an, uh, a solution for her. So actually, two days later, she was operated in Caracas. Oh, great. So yeah. Uh, so hopefully they can catch up also in the rally somewhere, but uh, for Specade it's over. So it was a very sad couple oh. of weeks. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope it gets better. Yeah, hopefully too. At least we have some hope now too. So there's still a lot of things that go, can go wrong for us, but um, there is hope. What yeah. what is the date range? Like what what is the? Can you give me like a, a, a basic overview of what kind of dates you're looking at? Like one month from now, everybody's going through the canal. Yeah. So uh, in the beginning of March and end of uh, end of February, beginning of March, all the boats are going through the canal. Then they are going to uh, the Galapagos, and they leave the Galapagos on the first of April for the big ocean crossing to the Marquesas. And so it's February 17 now, and if you can get the boat finished by the last week of March, we go through the canal really fast, and then you can... And then we can catch up on the market. Well, At least, and then we can do the ocean, the big ocean crossing together. That's what we are hoping for. Yeah. Well, you're, you're going to be a lot faster than a lot of those boats, so maybe Yeah, you but there are spend... a lot of fast Outremeres in the group. Oh, that's true. So there are some monohills, uh, Alures and Garcias, and of course they are slower than us. And um, uh, but we can be fast. Yeah, we can catch up with them. That's that's not a problem. So yeah. Test that fix. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let them know if it works. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So 
Let's go back. The, I had a few questions from this story. Yeah, tell us. Uh, we're going to start at the beginning with your, not the beginning, beginning with your swallow, but with the um, uh, 39 foot lagoon that you have. Yes. Did you buy that new from the factory? Yeah, we bought that new from the factory and we uh, actually um, brought it from uh, Les Sables de Lon, where it was built to Holland in September in uh, over the Gulf of Biscay. That was actually for me also the first time that uh, I was on the ocean because I was sailing on the North Sea and in Scandinavia before. Um, and then I was thinking, he, did, he always wanted to see shore, but he's not going to see shore when we are going to do this, but I don't know if- Let's he just did. not tell him. If, yeah, exactly. I don't know if he realizes that, so he slowly got used to it. So we hopped along the coast and on the islands in the uh, in the Gulf of Biscay to Brest and then up to Holland. And then the boat was with Nautis Quartier, that's uh, the dealer of uh, Lagoon in Holland. In the whole winter, and they installed a water maker and a washing machine and did all kinds of stuff. And in April, with the snow still on deck, we left for Norway. So, yeah. And that was an amazing trip. I was going to ask that. So that was my next question. Beautiful. The low boat, and it is so beautiful. So, and, and the midnight sun, we crossed the Arctic Circle in oh, the beautiful. midnight sun. It was, it was an amazing trip. And then he was all, he was also sold for bigger uh, trips with the uh, with the boat he he said this is absolutely the life i like nice when when we just met he was like mm, sailing okay <laughs> we're going to try on the lake but that was how we started yeah, and beautiful. then in 2016 when we went to norway and back he was like he was completely sold uh -huh. tell, so tell it yourself mark you were sold or not we were talking about Norway. What? Yes, after Norway. It, we were it, saying, I was saying in the beginning you were not even sure if you wanted to sail bigger trips. Tell us. No, but in Norway the, the trips are of course uh, limited. Well, we, we have been building it up. Yeah. And so. Um, and it, it's along the sh along the coast for a long time. Yeah, but in in the biggest crossing I've done so far. Uh, was in the beginning of going to Norway. Yeah. Well, we were we were kind of close to the Danish coast. And for <laughs> him that felt safe. But to be honest, with the westerly winds in 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 that area, <laughs> for me, yeah. I wanted to be away from the coast because I knew it's a very dangerous coast because it's uh, yeah. lager. Well, how do well, you say? It's, it's not all rational, of course. No, it's not. But for, for me, him, it's a it good idea safe. that I know what all the, uh, there was land there, but I know in the middle. You can't, you can't so, even approach it. So the prevailing winds are pushing you on shore. You're on exactly. a, a lee shore. Yes. If, if exactly. there are big storms on the North Sea, then uh, then this is, is a really dangerous coast. Yeah. But luckily, we and had the weather a, was okay. We had a weather window with easterly winds, so then it oh, was, even had easterly winds. Yeah, so it was safe for us to cross. Yeah. So that was not a problem. So and we crossed with the 39, uh, with the 39 to the south of uh, of Norway. Yeah, 40 and from, hours. And from that moment on, it was hopping along the coast and all kinds of islands, uh, 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 fjords, glaciers. It, it was, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, well, until now, it's number one on our list, uh, on my list at least. But like, uh, prefers it a little bit warmer than uh, the average temperatures in uh, Norway. <laughs> of course. But, yeah. yeah, me too. For me, yeah. for me, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and we we had uh, several very very warm, beautiful days yeah. exactly when we were in Lofoten. and so yeah. we were pretty lucky. Uh, yeah, in that exactly. Area. Yeah, and we had no rain in Bergen because Bergen is a place where it rains. 300 days a year oh wow and we, we had sunshine there. Yeah, sunshine there so yeah. we were pretty lucky but we yeah, also you are lucky yeah. yeah and we but we also had weeks of rain but with the lagoon it was pretty good we had a sport top and we can we could sail the boat completely covered so i was heater. and we had a heater in it so we were completely fine mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. then and then whose decision was it to say hey let's let's get a boat that's roughly double the size i mean from a 39 well, to a 52 uh, that's a lot really bigger boat. Uh, yeah well we when we bought the 39 i was of, of course looking at well we didn't know a lot about catamarans so we were looking at their uh, website and i i already said to Mareik at that point 
I think I prefer the 52. Yeah, but at, at that moment, he was not very experienced yet. So I knew I had to do it. And for me, that was like, oh my God, I can't handle that. I'm not just not strong enough for the forces of such a big boat with such huge sails. And I was not uh, completely sure that uh, he would know what to do, like bringing in a spinnaker uh, on a boat like that. So uh, I was like, oh my God, that's yeah. just too big. Yeah, the spinnakers, the, the spinnakers is a different story because there you, you sometimes really need strength as well. Uh, the other sails, is, is, uh, as, as soon as you have the electric winches, the other sails, it's not a big difference. They become a lot more manageable with the, electric the, winches. The 39 and the 52 were, the 39 was basically a small 52. It, you, you can see that they designed the 52 first and then decided to make a smaller model as well. I see. Um, uh, so it wasn't a big, it wasn't that, that big end, of a step. In the end, it was perfect. We were afraid uh, of it. Marijko was really afraid of it. So yeah. We had some uh, interesting I nights it was way uh, too big. together uh, <laughs> about this decision. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, uh, she, she had a, a couple of demands that yeah. we had to fill in. What was that? So, uh, so I think we needed a winch on the, we needed an option to be able to roll in uh, the sail when it was too much wind. So we put a we put a winch on the front deck. An extra winch for the for, the, uh, for rolling in the code zero. For the furler. Yeah. She, she wanted a, a skipper uh, to, uh, to to help us. For the uh, first two uh, weeks, like sort of a walking manual. That's actually a really good idea for any boat owner. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And and even if you have some experience, uh, it's not only about sailing the boat, but it's about uh, learning all the equipment, uh, which might be similar, but it might be different on, on a bigger boat as well. Yeah, and, 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 and of course, we had to sail the boat in the spring, in fe starting in February, in February, over the Gulf of Biscay, which is one of the most dangerous seas in the world, to, uh, to, to La Grande Mediterranean. Mode, to the Mediterranean. And that's not the best time to do it. It's not the best timing in the year. So I said to Mark, I want to do it. I'm fine, but I want to have somebody who really knows what he's doing and who has yeah. experience on this boat. So we made a deal that boat. the skipper would stay on board until Marijke would say, now I feel comfortable uh, myself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, and th was that a good decision? Very good decision. Yeah, that was a good decision. But then yeah. in that, that in that smart. trip, we ended up in this huge storm oh, between no. Gibraltar <laughs> and uh, Ibiza. And well, we probably if the skipper wouldn't have been there, we would never have no. ended up in the storm. No, because, no. But, but no, I would have decided to stay, to stay put. There was a forecast of 45, 48 knots in the gusts uh, when we were in Gibraltar. And uh, it would be all the way down winds. As a, so uh, we wanted to bad. go to Ibiza in uh, Bel uh, Balearics, uh, Spain. And, and, um, and the skipper said, oh, yeah, we can do it because the, the boat can handle it easily. And then we are there pretty fast. So that's so good. You asked him, can and you I, do it alone? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I said, can you do it alone? I can go to bed? Yes, he said, yes, I, I can, can do wow. it alone. Uh, but then in the end, I think it, it, uh, it uh, got interesting even for him. Uh, yeah, because we ended up with 56 knots instead Whoa, of 45. That's a lot. Uh, we, but you were going with it. Yes. We were going with it, but we, we had hours in a row where the wind was above 50. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Not like one and, gust and or how so. did you? logistically what did he, what did he have like a triple reef main only just well, a little bit we, of jib out we found out that we didn't have the line for the third reef on board oh, no. yet uh, yet <laughs> the boat was brand new and a couple of things had to be delivered afterwards uh, so we didn't have the line for the third reef and so, once we found out that the third reef was really necessary, there was so much wind that, that you can't turn the boat into the wind anymore. Yeah, yeah, we could have forced it but but then he ah. rolled in the he rolled in the jib mm-hmm so we and, were with two reefs we, in the main and no jib. Oof, that's, that's still too we, much sail. Yeah, it was too Way much. too much. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, but the boat handled the it. Hand, the yeah. boat handled it. We Good. had the same autopilot uh, as we have here on Utrecht now, yeah. and the boat was on autopilot all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even. And the autopilot handled it. Yes. The autopilot wow. handled it. Yeah. yeah. We mm -hmm. were just sitting in inside and cooking and. Wow. Uh, Sleeping. There's a video about that as well, and it's, it's the most watched video that we have, over yeah. a million uh, views. But about you in a Force Ten in the <laughs> Fifty Two Lagoon. 
Yeah, I'm doing 27 knots with the lagoon. You actually went faster on that boat than yes, you did on this yeah, one. Actually, yeah. yes. well, What's know. your top speed on this one? Uh, 24 knots, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah. But that's yeah, just that's... normal normal sailing. This is this is very abnormal. I think we have the absolute top speed of, uh, of lagoon. every lagoon. Of any ever. lagoon ever. Yeah, yeah probably. Uh, that's at least what, and you're what, what lagoon says. But, uh, you're thinking because of the momentum of the boat? Three, three waves in, in three a row. Waves. It's, this boat will probably go faster at, at a certain time, but then it, it won't stop as abruptly. Uh, it, it more slides or cuts through the water. And even if it hits the next wave, we found out uh, in, in our Atlantic crossing this time that it all uh, goes much uh, smoother. It accelerates. It's not going on in this boat. It, like, on this boat. Yeah, on this boat, it's going over it. It's like. And what is the weight difference? Um, well, it's about half the weight. Wow. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah. It's not so, so we are uh, even a little bit heavy for 55, I guess. Um, uh, uh, we, we know of two other 55s that are probably under uh, 15 tons, loaded with fuel and water and everything on. And we, we're probably just above 16 tons, but uh, our lagoon uh, fully loaded was 27. Wow. Uh, so it, it's That's big, more than my oyster. My oyster is 22. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And that's solid fiberglass. Yeah, yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on the differences of the two boats? And what do you like and dislike about both? That, that's to, more your topic. To yeah. start with, we really like both. No negative thoughts about Lagoon at all. Well, at least we, not about the 52 we had. No, we had a, we had a very good time on it. And, and, and it's, it kept us safe through the storm. So. We have no complaints whatsoever, but it's totally different. It's uh, like this is a, a different, um, um, how do you say that? Concept. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. This is a total different concept. And um, and I think in this stage of our experience, we are we were ready for an ultramare. It's more complex to sail. We have several front sails, so it's it's a lot of work. You lost a lot of kilos <laughs> working on this boat. Yeah, but it depends when you're going to do what we're doing now, sailing around the world. Yeah, I, I think there, I I can't imagine for us for our situation a better boat than than you to mare, no. uh, that we have now. But if you're if you're uh, have a, if you have a home base on the on the mat somewhere and you're just do day cruising and. You, uh, you want to be with a lot of friends partying on the boat, uh, then, then the lagoon, uh, then the lagoon would be a very, very good solution, I guess. Yeah, so so it, it just depends on what you want to do and, and what your goal is. We are very happy that the, in, state, in this stage of life, going around the world, doing this in this ultra -America. And we felt safe also, on, the, on the 52 when we had the, the 7 to 10 meter waves yeah. uh, on the Atlantic back to Azores. We felt completely we, safe. We felt very safe as well. So. It's it's not a bad boat, the, Got it. Uh, the Lagoon. We're still really positive about the uh, 52, the Sporta model. We're, we're a little bit less positive about Flybridge for our situation. But uh, again, oh yeah. Yeah. Let, this yeah. is Lufthansa now. No, United. United. Is it? United. Yeah. We're right underneath the airport. So, <laughs> I mean, the, the planes literally fly right over us. It's kind of cool. It's, yeah. kind of cool. it's good then, to take your friends and tourists and stuff over there because you can literally like take your boat right underneath the planes as they're. Yeah, yeah. we were thinking of going, going to this island. Uh, this here. island there, when the KLM comes over at six six thirty uh, every day, and then going on that island and filming it coming over. Yeah, that'd be cool. That would be really cool. Yeah. But today it's too windy. But maybe when it's a little bit. I'll less. go with you. I'd like to. Do yeah, that. you do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe tomorrow. You yeah. Know. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, both boats are great, but can you talk? Can you talk to me about the differences in like um, comfortability or ride? Or do you notice that this boat is a little bit more smooth? Or yeah, yeah it's, it's it's not a little bit more smooth. It's much more smooth. The the hulls are about half the size. Now uh, you're talking about width. Yeah, the width. Yeah, the width yeah. of the yeah. hulls is half the size. The the rest of the dimensions is is about the same. So the cockpit and the saloon, there's not much difference, but but uh, the lagoon had more space in the hulls. Yeah, well, depends on, uh, I, I get comments from people that say, well, I want to walk around the bed and... Uh, we could in the lagoon, you could uh, walk around the bed and here you have to climb in. Yeah. That's, but then we say, yeah, if you, do, if you can't be, if, you, if you're not able to climb in the bed anymore, 
then maybe you mustn't sail a boat like maybe this. Maybe it's time for a trawler. <laughs> yeah, or a crew, or I don't know. But, yeah, but, no. uh, so so it is it is just for um, yeah for different uh, types of life, different people, different uh, uh, um, size of group. Yeah, and the crossings, the crossings we do now. Uh, yeah, it's, are much quicker. Yeah, the, we and do so the, the 20, 30 percent faster now. Wow. So yeah, that's so it's not twice as fast. And uh, are you are you taking reefs at the same time? About like at 17 knots, we need to put the first reef mm -hmm. in. There's or? not a, there's not a big difference, but we uh, upwind. Uh, we the manual says the manual flooring Mars says we have to take the first reef at 31 knots apparent. 31. Yeah, oh, so apparent. Apparent. Apparent, yeah. yeah, and downwind uh, 24. That makes sense. Yeah, but but so we ha we don't have to reef basically before 30 knots uh, when we go downwind. Uh, 30 knots true, and but, but on actually the, we on do. the lagoon it was it's what not, it was not much. It was difference. not much different, but we do because you all, you're already feeling the motion of the boat. You can see how much it's steering, uh, how, how hard the, the uh, pilot, has, the to pilot has to work. Oh, and no, it was our friend from the Coast Guard. So, yeah. so most of the time we reef a little bit earlier than in the book, because then it feels more stable on the on the rudder and on the yachter pilot. So, what? but the big difference was with the lagoon going uh, downwind over the waves, um, when it was blowing hard and we had a little bit too much sail, then I could feel every wave. I could feel, mm, and you feel the ricking going like. Mm, every wave and um, and with this boat I don't feel that because we we went over the Atlantic Ocean in nine days and we 80% of the time we did it with the uh, heavy heavy weather spinnaker and then sometimes there is a big squall and then we even had winds up to 40 knots with the spinnaker and then it's that's a little bit scary, but the boat is never doing that. Like oh, it's yeah. just going over it. It's, and you can see it on our films. You can see the boat, um, sort of the, the nose come out of the water. It's sort of it's light in the front. It's so it's very it, light when, in the when front. When it hits it's, down, it pops back up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Mark did a lot of um, drone images of that uh, cool. trip, and we have a beautiful film about that. Maybe I can crossing. borrow that and, and put it in here. Oh yeah, yeah. You. That might be really nice. Yeah, it's it's very nice. We also had a lot of views on that film, uh, the crossing, the Atlantic crossing, and yeah. the drone images that you made. How about the? Um, I have a question. Was it difficult to have dagger boards to get used to using no. the dagger boards, no. and and do they affect your upwind performance a lot? Yes, of course. You can sail upwind with this boat like a monohull, so that's a big difference. But operating them is not so difficult because in the beginning there is a setting that you put them on deck level and if you just put them there you can just don't think about them and leave them there and it doesn't matter what you do if you go upwind, downwind, whatever. It's just like a medium-sized solution and uh, and then later on you start optimizing putting one up or both up a little bit more or whatever but most of the time we have them a little bit down even though downwind you don't need to have them down but for us it's sort of a safety if we hit something we prefer to hit the decker boards first and not the rudders so um, so most of the time we have them down a little bit even though the performance is better taking them up completely we don't do it okay so yeah cool um, one one reason to take them up completely and one reason i really like daggerboard catamarans my last cat was a daggerboard yeah, cat yeah, yeah. is when you're beam on to big waves and you're right, kind of riding the waves like this and the, yeah. and the waves are coming uh you you actually with a, a daggerboard boat you have a very smooth surface with the boards up yeah. so it'll make you crab a lot more and yeah. slide on the waves and it has less less propensity to trip on itself not to say that there's much more chance of a boat flipping but it makes me feel better yeah, that's knowing true. that I don't but have anything down there to trip it up. That's true. But you have the rudders and all the force is on the rudder then. Yeah. Yeah. So and I snapped off both the rudders on my boat. <laughs> so maybe that's horrible advice. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, in all, in all fairness, my rudder posts were fiberglass. And then when I changed them out, I used double walled aluminum in it and then they never had a problem. Okay. So yeah, I so. think my boat was not built for what I was doing. I, I yeah, it, it was built for like a fast day sailor, cool boat, and I was taking it around the world. <laughs> Plywood boat. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think this boat is really made for going around the world. Yeah, I think. Yeah, looks like especially it. after the crash. Uh, if I see the, the the damage, of course, the crossbeam is completely damaged, and because he hit it. But if that there, the fact that there is no crack in the hull, I was completely surprised. Yeah, that boat is that has, has to be 50, 60 tons boat that hit you. It was uh, 67 tons. Oh, I was right. Yeah, uh, and you filmed low. it going here through the water, so yeah. you can see how fast it goes. I, I know how fast it goes. That's so, one of the most prevalent boats around here. They they go nine knots everywhere. Yeah. And they probably hit you at nine knots. Probably. So Hopefully, seventy they... tons of boat hitting you at nine knots didn't um, didn't break the boat too much. No, no. But it so... did do a number on your crossbeam. Yeah. And be careful if you walk up there, because when I was going yeah, up there, yeah. I got splinters all splinters, over. Splinters. Yeah. Be real careful. Yeah, I have to wear shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, any last last words about um, your adventure, your your uh, your YouTube channel? So. Cross your fingers I that we are going to continue. Both of them crossed Because for you. there's yeah, so much that can go wrong still. So uh, even though Utermere does his utmost, um, yeah, every, here everything can go wrong with the crane, with the, with the customs, whatever. So cross your fingers that we can continue our Cat Crate Circle YouTube channel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, you will be. And I think there'll be a lot of people listening to this that really want to see the end of this story. Yeah. And including me. I'm, I, I really want you guys to continue and, yeah, and have yeah, some yeah. fun. So thank you guys so much for spending an hour with me and telling me your story. How spending an hour? It's, it's been four hours. Yeah, okay. Well, in, in, in their land, it's only an hour. Yeah, with carbon splinters everywhere, <laughs> boats dragging. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> I'm kind of a mess, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I really appreciate the time. And uh, it was really nice to meet you guys. I hope that we meet again in the future. And I hope that your uh, the end to this story goes very well for you. My fingers are crossed. Everybody cross your fingers for these guys. Let's get them on, yeah. on track and that on board. Really help. Yeah. And uh, if, if people want to see the end of this story, where do they go? Well, they can follow us on YouTube, Cat Great Circle. They can follow us on Instagram, which is basically up to date every day, more or less. We don't do Patreon stuff and uh, stuff like that. So uh, our material is most of the time, uh, it's uh, it's up to date. Okay, and uh, that's those yeah. two places. You don't have Facebook or anything? We have Facebook, Cat Great Circle as well. Okay. So Cat Great Circle. Yeah, they'll <laughs> find you. And they'll find us. All right. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. It was nice to meet you guys. It was really nice. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> So, as you can see, she plays guitar, and we're gonna we're gonna jam now. And if you want to see the jam session, maybe I'll put a little bit of it on the end of the podcast. But uh, we actually came back here because I really wanted to touch on one more point, which is that you are the captain of this vessel, and have been the captain for your entire journey with Mark, and and that dynamic you don't see very often. And I think it's amazing and empowering. And I think you should explain that relationship and how that's uh, been troublesome and uh, empowering to you, just for everybody else out there and for all the female viewers that are maybe questioning, can I, can I be captain? So yeah. And yeah, uh, please, could, please can you do that without completely depowering <laughs> me? I know I'm just a deck slave, but <laughs> let me keep a little bit of dignity here. <laughs> Just. Yeah, of course, um, uh, I was the captain in the beginning uh, because uh, well, actually power. everything Mark learned, was he learned it from me. Because when we met each other, he was not a sailor, he didn't sail at all. So, uh, of course, it was logical that when we were sailing together that I was the captain. And you were talking about dynamics. Sometimes uh, when we started our trip with the lagoon, the first year it was fine because he just uh, tried to learn everything from me and uh, he believed me in everything I said but then the next year he had already a lot of knowledge and then he started questioning and then suddenly it was why because last year you said this and now I have to do that so and he has a um, very extremely good memory so he remembers everything so Sometimes you act differently in a different situation, depending on where the wind comes from. Is it are there waves? Yes or no? Uh, uh, how big is the the area where you're going in? So depending on the situation, you 
for instance, hang your uh, uh, fenders out before you go in a harbor or uh, a lock, or you do it afterwards, depending on how many waves are there outside, how much time do you have inside. And uh, but then he was confronting me last year. You said you have I have to do it outside. Now you say I have to do it inside. You know what my answer to that is? Just do what I say. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, but but the funny thing is when we were working, uh, we were both in IT. We always worked together, and he was always my boss. So I had to do what he was saying. Wow. And. Um, and now on the boat, it's the other way around. And that's not always easy. Yeah. But uh, I would encourage all the, um, the women who had sailed in the past and uh, find a partner that can't sail, just go for it, do it. Don't be afraid. It's not only the man who can do it on his own, it's only the women. So it's also the women, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, so we just started. And that's the reason why I wanted to start in a small boat. And that's the reason why I had uh, problems going to a bigger boat because I wanted to know that I could handle the boat on my own. Yeah. And because I don't have the muscles that he have, has. Wow. That's an interesting dynamic. So, yeah. So that's the reason why we build it up like this. And to be honest, now, Mark, now your story comes. To be honest, now I don't need to be the captain anymore. He is uh, extremely capable of uh, dealing the boat on his own. No, no, but you still need to be the captain because you have a much, much better overview of everything that happens on board. Yeah, that's that's true. Like I can steer the boat. That's a different uh, thing. Uh, that's true. I have I have an overview. I'm, uh, so when we are working together, Mark is always doing all the heavy stuff. So he is uh, handling the sails on the foredeck. He is doing the lines and the fenders and all the heavy stuff. And I'm always standing on the rudder and doing the, the, the winches. So I just try to oversee the whole boat and see everything and just can say like... That's so it's still even now you are the captain of the boat. Yes. If she will remain there. Yeah. The and well. if, if the boat's hailed, do you get on the radio? What is hailed? So hailed well? means um, if, if it's called, uh, if oh, somebody can, calls we you. We can both do it, but, but I'm the only one who have my papers for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, sometimes it's him, sometimes it's me. It's, and you're uh, better with officials. I am absolutely better with officials. <laughs> sometimes Mark do. doesn't have patience. No. And Nope. Much better. Yeah. And has the has this dynamic ever hurt your relationship? Like, has there ever been a time where you just had to be like, "Listen, I'm the captain. You sit down and shut up." Yes, I did. Yes, yeah. I did that once or twice, maybe, and and that that's not nice. No, but and, and people and when a when a man does that, it's pretty normal. Yeah. Because he's the captain, and he. But when a woman does that, then she's a bitch. Mm. So it is. Yeah, but there has to be. I mean. Yeah. Every once in a while, there just has to be a line. There has to be a captain. That's yeah. on a boat. There, there has to be someone that's in charge because otherwise, it's too many people making too many decisions, and then it's indecision. And then, if yeah. indecision goes along too far, uh, in, in in points of crisis where you only have seconds to, yeah, yeah. you know, put halyards on the front of your bow before it just rips up the beam and the whole mast yeah. falls in the water. Yeah, yeah. You need that to happen and you need to know who's captain. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And and because uh, since he's learning and learning and learning a lot more, we have a lot more discussions, of course. And then I found myself sometimes like, shut your mouth and do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, actually. That's, exactly, that's, that's what I did at Mark, sorry. Yeah? That's, that's what you were fishing for. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But you, but you know uh, I did that. I wanted so. to picture you with your tail between your legs, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't picture me with my tail between my legs, please. <laughs> oh man, that's so, funny. Yeah. But, He's a good but, sport. But most of the time, it is uh, we are just a really good team. Good. And uh, and he is way better in all the electronics. Uh, he thinks in uh, in figures. Yeah. So he knows like oh, we can go up to uh, thirty uh, apparent wind or up to. And I'm just a sailor. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you know when it is because you feel it. Yeah, I can feel it. So I'm sometimes I'm asking him, um, Mark, uh, with this sail, uh, how much apparent can we have? Because That's a great dynamic, actually. Yeah, it's yeah, good actually. that you have both. Yeah. That way he can back you up. So and and also like um, he programs all the screens. Uh, he put guard zones in the uh, um, radar. Oh, so he's probably the better navigator. Uh, he's he's. 
No, navigation we can do both, mm -hmm. but electronics and all the equipment that we have on board, he's way better than me. I, can, I use them, yeah. but he programs them. Cool. So, uh, so, and I am more the intuitive sailor. I have more overview. I see whatever goes wrong. And But I have to admit, in the beginning, Mark didn't see anything, what, hap what was happening. He could just pull and then, so I had to warn him, no, that's going wrong there or whatever. I had to see everything, but he sees more and more now. So yeah. that's also experience. It's, yep. um, so yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think we are pretty fine together on the boat. And uh, uh, I try to give him space. That's important. To do whatever he's best in. And then, uh, so in the end, at the moment, we are just a team. But when shit hits the fan, then it's me. And that's the only reason why I'm still a captain. And because as long as you both sail the boat perfectly himself now. As long as you both understand that and that's the rule, then that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we do it. Yeah. Good. And Beautiful. to be honest, he is better capable of sailing the boat on his own than me because. There are so many tasks on the boat that are just, just too heavy for me. I have to admit it. Sorry, women. He's way more powerful, has way more muscles than I have. So, yeah. One of the reasons I didn't bring this up during the actual podcast and why we're kind of putting this addendum on is that she plays guitar and didn't tell me. And when we went back to my boat to have lunch, I have a guitar and we started jamming. I'm like, oh man, we need to put this on the end of the podcast. And another reason was I actually thought about asking but i didn't want to sound sexist and i thought maybe bringing this up would would sound like you know like oh my gosh you're a female captain there's never a female captain but actually it's very empowering to hear that so i very much commend you for for being the captain on your journey that's really cool yeah how hard is it i mean what what advice would you give to a, a girl that wanted Bill chauvinist a chauvinist yeah Bill, there you go didn't want to be a male chauvinist. i didn't want to be a chauvinist exactly that's it yeah so what advice would you give to a woman that maybe has trepidation about taking her partner out on a boat or, or having this dream and maybe the partner doesn't, just like your dynamic? You must be a very strong-willed woman if you made him go. Uh, if I would have forced him, he would have, nev he would have never have gone because that's not the way it works with him. But it's, we were just slowly growing into it. And I, I let him take the decision where to go, where he felt comfortable with. And uh, I let him take the decision which boat, where he felt comfort comfortable in. Because I was a monohull sailor. I didn't even think about catamarans. And, uh, but I really didn't care if he wants to have a catamaran, then we go on a catamaran. So that's, that's the way I was thinking. So the, you basically did the same thing as a man would do for to, to, to get his wife. Yeah, exactly. Sailing with him. Yeah, yeah exactly. what a good partner. Yeah. That's a good partner. And um, and I would say to all the women who are in doubt, um, don't feel insecure. Um, there is absolutely a difference between men and women. I uh, we have to admit that, and it also has to do with your health. So maybe some women are more powerful than a man because the man has health issues or whatever. It, it doesn't matter. But there is a difference always. And just accept that and do where you're good in. And uh, take care that the other one, that you are a team, that the other one can do the things that you can't do. So, um, and I think lots of women are um, insecure about themselves. Like, oh my God, I can't. It's too difficult or whatever. I would say just do it. Yeah, but there are plenty of female sailors. Uh, yeah. Like uh, you, you did. I love uh, Nikki Henderson. You did the ladies, ladies only with Nikki as well. Yeah, I love Nikki Henderson. She is so powerful. She is so good, and she's very young, and she's an extremely good sailor already. She sailed actually with La Vagabonde over uh, over the Atlantic, the boat back with Greta. Oh, she was, was the captain. Her. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Or I don't know if she was the captain or uh, Riley. Riley was the captain or I don't know how this they dynamic was. They sent her. They sent her and she was helping. Maybe she was the captain. I don't know. I, I don't know. Have you ever met Laura Decker? Because she's from your country. Right? Yes, she's from my country. I, I love the story. I never met her because she lives at the moment. She lives in, uh, uh, in New Zealand. She never wants to go back to Holland again. And um, there were lots of... Um, 
stories in Holland about this. People criticizing her. She's way too young. You can't do that. And blah, 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 blah. blah. Lots of, uh, yeah, there were lots of people against each other. And I was always like, because I already read stories of her in the, the magazine Seile that we have in Holland, Sailing it's called. And, um, and I knew that she was 11 years old when she sailed solo on a Hurley 700, I think it was, I'm not sure, but I think it was something like that, with her dog to England and back to Holland. Wow, so I what knew, a badass. I knew she was so much better than way big guys. Yeah. And I also knew that the, uh, the boat that they were preparing for her with the two masts, uh, with a smaller sail so that she could handle it, I think they were really smart and doing it a safe way. Yeah. So I was like, my God, why is everybody interfering in this case? Let her go if she wants. Yeah, let her do her thing. Let her do her thing. And finally, she proved that she could. So, um, but she really had to uh, escape from Holland and escape from the government and, and all the rules and etc. She really had to. That's one of the reasons I'm out here yeah. to escape from all the yeah. rules and bureaucracy and yeah. bullshit. Yeah, yeah. All so right. no, I love that story of Laura Decker, yeah. and I really, uh, yeah, admire what she's doing. Cool. Very good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, again, thanks. Let's play guitar now. Let's play guitar. All yeah, right. A lot, cool. A lot nicer. Okay. Big thank you to Marika and Mark for their time. If you guys would like to see more of them, please search Cat Great Circle on Google. They are actually fixed and back on the road at this time right now. So big congratulations to them. And unfortunately, I'm not going to put the jam session up here. I'll be uploading that to Patreon. So if you'd like to hear that, please click support this podcast channel or go to patreon.com slash svzingaro. As always, much love. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. <laughs>